in scriptures, but that's okay. There was a, there's a, Danielle had told me a couple of weeks ago that there was this, it seemed like he was maybe an older gentleman because he referred to me as a young preacher. And he was, dude, he was, at first, he was telling me what he was saying. I mean, he was all fired up about this young preacher. He was like, man, this is the best young preacher until he realized I didn't agree with him on the rap. <laughs> and then he was like, he was pounding me. He was like, context, context. Sir, I just want to thank you, first of all, for watching. And I also want to thank you for commenting. And I, and I was kind of making fun, but I wasn't really wanting to make fun to you. And hopefully you'll still continue to watch. But I really want to thank you for sending in some concepts or scriptures. So he did. He, he said, listen, you want some scriptures? I'll give you some scripture. Well, so I want to just kind of like share with you some of the concepts that he gave. And we've already covered them so far. The only one we haven't covered has to do with the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to cover 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in complete detail. That's one chapter that because that is a hugely important chapter that we need to understand because it's interconnected to, uh, to end time stuff. So let's see if we can go in the scripture. So the first thing he said was he said about a seven year period and, and he was talking about, he was equating, he didn't give any specifics, but he talked about Daniel 9, which we covered the book of Daniel verse by verse. And he talked about Daniel 9, and he talked about that seven year period. Well, I, I already explained to y'all about in Daniel chapter 9, um, and about, we already talked, if you're watching, but my understanding was, was because there was a seven year period that in his mind, he was equating that there had to be a pre-tribulation rapture because there was a, there was a seven year period. Now I'm not going to read this out of the Strong's. I mean, I'm sorry, out of the King James version. And the only reason is because it's very wordy and it's so, and it's a little bit difficult to understand in the old English. So I'm just going to read this out of the NASB, but you can read it in any version and it's saying the same thing. I'm just letting you know that sometimes a more modern English is a little bit easier to understand in certain passages. So if you want to follow in the King James, you can follow in the King James. If we had time, I would read it in both so that you could see it. But it says 70 weeks have been decreed for your people. So the angel came to give a word to Daniel. We have already broken this down that the 70 weeks actually refer to 70 sets of seven year period. Y'all remember that? I mean, we already discussed it. So which equals out to 490 total years. And, and then he goes on to say, and your holy city. So it's talking about all of the things that are going to be accomplished by the end of this 490 years. Some of these things have already been accomplished by Jesus. Some of these things won't be completely fulfilled until Jesus comes back. And so for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint, the NASB says, the most holy place. Some translations say the most holy. Scholars are divided over it. The King James Version says the most holy. If it's the most holy, then it's talking about on the throne of David, and he takes his rule, okay? If it's the most holy place, then it's talking about the temple, you know, whatever the case. I kind of think it's really talking about Jesus, like the King James says. That's my opinion. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. That's talking about Jesus. See, this is even more clear than it was in the, in the King James, in my opinion. Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, we broke this down when we covered Daniel. The seven weeks and 62 equals what? Seven and 62 equals... 69, right? 69. Okay, if you equal that out to years, I know this is heavy duty stuff, I apologize. If you equal that out to e years, what is that? That's 483 years. That means seven years is missing. You understand? Because this because the prophecy was 490 years. So that's leaving a seven year outlier that has not been accounted for. That's where we get the seven year period from. We covered this in detail. I mentioned this probably 110 times. This is 111, right? Maybe not that many, but y'all have to remember how many times I've mentioned this. This is the only place in the Bible that I have found that mentions a specific seven year period. Throughout the book of Revelation, even in the book of Daniel, 1260 days, 42 months, you know, time, times, and half a time. All of those describe three and a half years. 
This is the only place that describes a seven-year period. We're, I'm not questioning whether or not there's a seven-year period. I've made it very clear there's a seven-year period, but that a seven-year period seven-year period, the rapture can come at another cost. Does that make sense? kind of make sense what I'm saying? I hope so. I know it's kind of wordy. I'm doing all this for the gentleman. Nothing in the people of the prince who is to come. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about, you know, who the prince who is to come? That's talking about the Antichrist. The people who are of the prince. And how do you know that that's the Antichrist? How do you know that's not talking about Jesus? Because I got into a big old conversation with a Jehovah Witness one time. I said, sir, you're misinterpreting the scriptures. You're attributing to Jesus what's the Antichrist. He's like, you're trying to send us the Antichrist? I said, yes, sir, absolutely. You think Jesus came to destroy? No, yeah. Jesus came to destroy, but he didn't come to destroy Jerusalem. Okay, he, he, wants to, he, he wants to heal his people, amen? So the prince that is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, well, we already see war, desolations are determined, and he, who's he? That's the Antichrist. Okay, I'm not trying to get all fancy with you in English language, but the word he is a pronoun that's antecedent to the previous subject. What does that mean? He is connected to who it was talking about before. Who it was talking about before was the, the people of the prince that is to come. It's talking about the prince that is to come. He will make a firm covenant. Now, the King James Version says he will, he will, I'm sorry, what was the wording? Reaffirm a covenant. It's, okay, so some people confirm. believe that. Confirm. confirm. Thank you. Some people believe it could be a covenant that's already in place, and I'll be mentioned to you before the Balfour Declaration, I think it was 1904. Okay, there's already a covenant in place that could be confirmed. This version is saying he's going to make a firm covenant with the many. The many is referring to the nation of Israel. Scholars are in agreement for that. For one week. That's that last seven year period. So basically what it's saying is. And this is the point I wanted to make for the gentleman. If he happens to be watching. That the event that initiates the last seven year period. Is not the rapture of the church according to the Bible. Which is what I have been told all of my life. But instead what I see in scripture. The event that initiates the last seven year period. Is the signing of the covenant between Antichrist and the nation of Israel. That's what initiates the last seven year period. This is what it says right here. He will make a firm covenant. Or he will confirm a covenant with the many. Talking about Israel. If I'm even doing it right. Half of what that context is. You don't just read it out of one chapter. This thing has to line up with every single passage that's talking about this this has to line up with matthew 24 that this has to where it says the abomination that causes desolation this has to line up with the other places in the book of Revelation. you can't just take one spot no and I've been, that's why i've been digging because in my mind all this stuff has to line up okay or else nothing lines up that's right does that make sense right. what i'm trying to say all right so i agree there's a last seven year period and I, and I agree it's going to start with something, but I disagree that it's going to start with it. That, that the scripture tells us with certainty that it's going to start with the rapture of the church. And if there is a scripture that says that, please text it to me so that we can not de deceive people. So that we can tell people the truth. Amen? That's right. Amen. All right. And so he's going to put a stop to it. So that was point number one. Point number two went back to the book of Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. And he said that after these things, this was the gentleman's point, that after these things, after Revelation chapter 3, you don't hear of the church anymore, right? And we, we would, most of us would agree on that. I mean, most of us have been in the church for any length of time. We already know that. And it's not, and I mean, I'm not trying to be sassy. I promise. I'm really not. It's not like I didn't know that. I was taught that. I was, when I first got saved, the first year I was saved, I was sitting in my sister's kitchen, in her kitchen table, in a Bible study on the book of Revelation, Sister Took was teaching it. I have, I knew this, okay, this is what I was taught my whole Christian life, but his, but this gentleman's point, sir, your point was, was that, and the church isn't heard of again until the end when Jesus comes back, screech the brakes. Throw it into reverse just for a second because in reality, what's talked about in Revelation chapter 19 doesn't mention that. Yeah, it doesn't mention the church at all. What it mentions is it mentions the saints. Okay, we're in, we're in the King James Version. 
And, and I'm just going to go ahead. True and righteous are his judgments. He has judged the great whore. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that one day Jesus is, who is the whore? Well, let me not even start preaching. It's the, it's the system that's been fighting against Jesus, against Yahweh, against the father and his plan for humanity since the beginning. All right. And he's going to judge it. Amen. Which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, they said, hallelujah. Her smoke rose up forever and ever. The four and twenty-four elders and the four beasts fell down to worship God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, his point was this. We don't hear of the church again until the church comes back with Jesus. It, the word ecclesia is not in Revelation 19, speaking of the church. The only word that he could be referring to is the word saints right here, dressed in white robes, coming back with Jesus. I don't deny that. I know, well, hallelujah. The Lord give me a, a, a white horse or a horse of some sort to ride back with King Jesus along with all the angels of God. I believe that. Amen. But look, let's take a look at this word saints, because I want to show you something. This is every time the word saints is used in the New Testament. Now, let's scroll down to the book of Revelation, because I want to make a point. I want to show you at least one verse that's in the book of Revelation, where the word saints is used. And it's used after chapter 4. Okay, and I want to show you what it says. All right? It says, let's see if we can find it right here. Revelation. It's an angel. Holy is he. See, sometimes the word saint is is translated as holy because the word saint is hagios and it means holy and it means separated, all right? And so sometimes it says holy, 20 more results, and the smoke of incense, we're going to talk about that tonight. And the nations were angry and it was given unto him to, oh look, here it is right here. Revelation chapter 13, we're going to get to it. It's specifically talking about the antichrist, specifically talking about the beast. And this is what it says right here. We haven't even got to this yet. Okay, now the only way to rectify this scripture and make us believe pre-trib is to say that the word saints here is talking about the Jews. That's it. But nowhere in the New Testament does the word saints used to talk about the Jews. Every single time it's talking about believers. And in the book of Revelation chapter 19, it said the saints are coming back with him. But look what it says in Revelation 13, 7, talking about the beast, talking about the Antichrist. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tigers. Some of the prophets, who do you father in heaven? And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so to the modern mind that wants to, that, that can only, that can't think beyond pre-tribulation rapture. They say, well, that would be contrary then because see, it's saying that the antichrist is gaining power over the saints. Jesus said that, the, that, that he would build his church and that the gates of heaven. No, 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 no. Just because saints die doesn't mean the devil wins in the end. If that were the case, what happened with the apostle Paul? If that was the case, what happened to Peter that was crucified upside down? If that were the case, what happened to Thomas whenever he got run through with a Brahmin sword? If that were the case, what happened to Mark when he was drugged behind a chariot through the streets of Egypt? No, the church was built on the blood of the martyrs. That's reality. Okay, that's the truth of the gospel. All right, so going back to that, sir, the word church is not used in the book in Revelation 19. The word saints is used, and the word saints is also in Revelation 13, and it says that right there. Now, when we get to 2 Thessalonians 2, we're going to talk about the restrainer. We're going to talk about some other things that are very important. All right, now we're moving back. Y'all ready? So here we go. So we're talking about, and this is just a quick review. And look, I thought, Aaron, appreciate you, brother. I thought you did a great job. I was having yeah. technical difficulty on the other end. And I know you were struggling a little bit, too. I think that the trick might be to, to disconnect and reconnect. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so 
we talked so far what we've covered is this seven year period, right? And on through the first three and a half years. And this is supposed to be seal number one. And we said seal number one was a white horse. That's what white is right there. And you probably can't see him, but that's a crown. Okay, it's kind of small. Sorry about that. So a white horse was a crown. A crown was given unto him, right? And it's talking about the angel. Sorry about that. Seal number three was a black horse, and that's some scales because that talked about famine, right? Seal number four was a, it says in the King James, a pale horse, but I told you that in the Greek, the word is chloros, and that means green because that's the color of death, and that's supposed to be a skull because, you know, that's the big thing now, <clears throat> death culture, okay? So seal number five is the martyrs. You remember that? And so the reason that I put this, this away is because in my opinion, whenever the Antichrist breaks the covenant at three and a half years, which we just talked about in Daniel chapter seven, it just so happens we talked about that. I believe that that is somewhere around the fifth seal point because that's when the martyrs are dying for the Lord. All right. Then that 1335 days that's talking about in Daniel is this 75 period that I believe Jesus was talking about great tribulation that has never been seen on the earth before, nor will it ever be again. And I believe that's the 75 year, 75 day period where Antichrist has revealed himself, where he has demanded people to take the mark and where martyrs are dying for the Lord. And some people will die. Some people will make it, you know, won't die and they'll make it to the rapture and, you know, there's a lot to be said, and some of us will still be, maybe, maybe, I'm saying, I don't want to be a false prophet. Some of us may still be alive when this happens, but there's a good, we don't know when this is going to happen, all right? Seal number six is, is when the sun became dark, that's supposed to be a sun and I X'd out its light, and the, and the moon became blood, and then that's where I put the rapture in the church, okay? You remember, so why did I put that there? And again... I've had conversations with some people and they're like, well, I just don't feel like that's enough evidence. And that's fine because we're all, we all got opinions and we're all trying to study the scriptures. But what I'm trying to say is, is the reason I believe that's the rapture is because there was an innumerable multitude of people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, and they were all dressed in white robes. Okay. And then now we're entering into the, the next part, which is wrath. And so tonight we're going to be discussing and introducing the seven <coughs> trumpets, which are the judgments of God. Now, if you'll remember, this is the beginning of the judgments. We'll talk more about the vials and interconnect all that at another time. But what I want you to remember is, is that in chapter, we're going to be in chapter eight tonight. But the whole chapter seven, if you'll remember, was kind of like, I, I, want to call, I don't want to call it a, parenthes, a parenthetical thing. But it was something that was, it was a standalone. Like the seals were chronological, the trumpets are chronological, but chapter 7 was the vision of the hundred and, the, the picture of the 144,000 that I said were in heaven being sealed. Do you remember that? And also the picture of the rapture, the, the multitude, or, or let me just say it like this in case you don't agree with me. The multitude was in heaven. So two pictures in chapter 7, the 144,000 and the multitude, and that that was stuck in the middle of the end of the seals and the beginning of the trumpets. All right, so here we go. Here's the first scripture I want you to see. Revelation chapter 8, two scriptures, verses 1 through 2. And when he had opened the seventh seal, I tried to make this point before, but until you see it, it's kind of hard to remember. The seventh seal Actually, what it does is it just opens up the first trumpet. The last seal, the sixth seal was the sun turning dark, the moon turning the blood, but the seventh seal really just opens up the first trumpet. See, when he said, and I opened the set, and when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. All right? So I want you to, uh, and now what I did was I just put 30 real big, because I want you to think about that. The Bible was very clear to make the point that there was 30 minutes of silence. Okay, now that may not seem like a big deal to you. I don't know what 30 minutes is in heaven. I mean, you know, really and truly it might be, I don't know. Because I mean, it said the day, 
day is with the Lord, you know, timing is, I get, but have you ever tried to be quiet for 30 minutes? Y'all might be able to do that. I don't know. It's like, you ain't ever been quiet for 30 minutes. But, but if I just stood here for 15 seconds and didn't say anything, I'm telling you right now, it would be kind of weird. <laughs> it would get awkward. I think that the Bible is trying to make a point. I don't know exactly. I mean, I got an opinion of what I think the point is, but he doesn't tell us exactly why it mentioned 30 minutes. Okay, so, but I do believe that the Bible is trying to make a point. And I believe that, that these, look, the seven, so wrath and this silence for 30 minutes. What I, this is what I believe, this is my opinion on this 30 minutes. The word silence, and as a matter of fact, I think this would be a good point for us to make a point about that. <laughs> we all come from different backgrounds in our walk with the Lord. Some churches are different than other churches, right? Uh, some denominations are different than other denominations. In a, in a church like ours, what is it like our church? Well, I don't really want to be labeled with anybody, but I do want to believe this. That we love the presence of God. Okay. And what we do want is we want the Holy Spirit to feel welcome in the house. Amen. Amen. And so when the Holy Spirit, like, I, listen, I'm not trying to be rude. I don't, please don't take me the wrong way. But I'm going to say, I'm going to talk like that. Okay. I don't really care what you felt like when you came into the house of the Lord. And it goes the same for me. I don't really, I, I don't really care what I feel like when I come into the house of the Lord. What I do believe is this. God is worthy. Amen. God is worthy no matter how I feel, no matter how bad my day was. You know, I mean, you know, I'm just, I was making a joke. And Tiki, my little dog, had a bad day the other day. But look, when I left Josh, she got in a fight with a possum. And then she ran across the street. She was like wanting to play with the dogs on the porch. And one of them growled at her. She's like, oh, you want some too? She like trying to fight with everybody. She, for some reason, that girl had a bad day. I don't know. Sometimes I have a bad day. Right? People accuse me of whatever. You get the point. Y'all been there. Y'all know. But God's still worthy. Why well, I'm going off on a rabbit trail, but I'm trying to talk about reverence. When we're in the midst of a service and the musicians are playing music and worshiping the Lord, that is not the time to sit there and have a major conversation with your neighbor. I'm just letting you know right now, right here, let it be said, the pastor said it. Look. Let me tell you something, brother Swagger to tell you. Don't why are you getting up and go to the bathroom in the middle of a song? I didn't heard the man say it before. I mean, he can't control everybody that needs to go up and tinkle, but the point is, or use the restroom, have some reverence for the presence of the Lord. Amen. 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 Does that make sense? Amen. All right, I believe Amen. silence is connected to reverence. Amen. I, because I believe, look, you know, while God doesn't, I don't believe God, well, I know this. The scripture says. You know, and I don't remember exactly where it is, but you'll remember if you've been reading the Bible. It says, "Enter it, go, go to the basically the the lake of fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels." It says it in the book of Revelation, the lake of fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. But there's going to be human beings there. God never intended for human beings to be there, but I guarantee when He created this earth, He already knew that there were some angels. Call them whatever you want, little G gods, angels, whatever you want to call them, some bad dudes that were created before the human race that rebelled against God, and he already had a place consigned for them. The Bible calls it Gehenna, it's the lake of fire. But unfortunately, human beings have also thrown in their lot with the liars. Okay, now... Many human beings much worse than other human beings. There's human beings on this earth, whether you believe it or not, doesn't make it real, doesn't make it not real. I'm here to tell you there it's real. There are human beings on the earth that practice major occultic witchcraft, have thrown their lot in purposely with Satan, and are doing all kind of crazy stuff on this earth to try to bring about the reign of the enemy. I'm telling you, it's real. Okay, again, that might be too much for you. For your brain to handle right now, but I'm telling—I mean, what? It's my opinion. It's real, all right. And those people are definitely consigned with the devil, with the devil and his angels. 
Unfortunately, there's also going to be a lot of collateral damage. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, you know, we probably shouldn't call it friendly fire, but I'm just trying to say there's a war going on. Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. There's a war going on, my friend. And the Lord is going to make this thing right. And unfortunately, look, I got something to say. I think I'm going to preach it next Sunday. But look, this Sunday. But listen, the part of the problem with the collateral damage is that the enemy knows that our flesh likes certain things. Right. Right. Somebody help me out. Right. The enemy wants to keep you in bondage. The enemy wants to keep me in bondage to the power of sin. Yeah. Because there's a bigger picture here. The enemy of your soul, the enemy of God doesn't want you to be free. See, that's what the message of the cross is all about. That's what Jesus is all about. That's what him dying on the cross, not just to give you a get into heaven free card, but to set you free today so that the enemy cannot hold you in bondage. Why? So that you open your lips and that you will be a witness for the Lord. It don't get no better than that, my friend. They may not preach it down the road, and I'm not trying to judge them. Let them preach whatever they think they're supposed to preach. I'm here to tell you. Listen, if somebody looking for a tickly ear message and somewhere else that's just going to make me feel good about myself, that I can have a little white picket fence in front of my yard and all my three kids, I wish all my, you know, all my three kids, listen, if your kids graduate college, praise God. If they make it out unscathed, praise God, even greater. Amen. And if your kids do good and they drive nice cars and they got good jobs and y'all all go to church together on stuff, praise God. God loves family. God doesn't want family to be destroyed. That's all good stuff. But can I tell you something? They got people sitting in churches and that's their only understanding of church. That's right. Does that make sense what that's I'm trying right. to say? I hope it makes sense because what I'm telling you is a false doctrine seeker sensitive message is pushing that. People want to hear that. People want to be comfy and cozy and they want to be told things that make them feel good. I'm here to tell you that the Lord called you to be a witness. Amen. Not in your own strength because if you try to do it in your own strength, you're going to fall on your face. Yes. But what I am trying to tell you is you're either saved or you're not wrong. And if you say the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of your heart and the spirit of the bride say come and let him who hears say come and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is saying, let me change you. Let me set you free because it's going to be a testimony. Yeah, yeah there's still going to be people out there that ain't going to let you live it down. Yeah. Come on. Amen. I've had people tell me your whole church is full of drug addicts and you were a drug addict and your best friend was a drug addict. Well, I ain't going to tell you what I told him because it's not important. <laughs> Your problem might not have been drugs, buddy, but let me tell you what you were if that's what you want to do. Okay. But the Lord has set me free, brother. And let me tell you this. The AA meeting that says, oh, my name is Matt and I'm an alcoholic or a drug addict. Lie. That's and what the word of God says, oh, you offended me. I'm like AA. Keep going to your AA meeting. I'm not trying to offend you on your AA meeting. I'm trying to tell you the word of God says something different than AA. Hallelujah. The word of God says I'm a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. The old has passed away and the new has come. Hallelujah. Because Jesus killed the old man. Jesus ain't into rehab, my friend. I've been in three of them. I was in three rehabs by the time I was 19. Can I tell you a secret? Jesus ain't into rehab. Jesus kills the old and gives resurrection power to the new. The problem that you and I have, and even Brad Bullock said this a long time ago, we got a surrender problem. Oh, come on, Brad. I hope you're watching. We got a surrender problem. See, our old flesh wants to stay alive. They don't want to surrender. And we get all, all right, there you go. There's silence in heaven, reverence and silence in heaven, because guess what? God never wanted to put human beings in hell. I don't believe that was his plan. But it's going to happen. Yep. It's going to happen. God's wrath is going to come. Amen? Amen. Look, here's another. Here we go. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it up with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar. I want you to see that because I'm going to hit that a little bit hard here in a moment. <coughs> which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense, which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Later, after I had done some of these slides, I kind of thought about putting another one in here of the tabernacle or the temple, because I wanted to try to give you a picture and I, and I didn't, well, let's just see if we can do this real quick. Since I didn't do it, let's see. Image of 
Let's see if we can do this. All right, here we go. They probably won't let me do it, but here we go. Let's see if we can. Nah, they won't let me. Man, they don't want me to steal his pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Why won't you let me steal your pictures? <laughs> oh, is that what you got to do? Hey, wow, if that works, dude, that's going to be too cool. All right. Huh? Save it to my photos, huh? And then I can, yeah, there we go. All right, let's see. Or if I would have helped, you trying to save all, look at all these roofs. <laughs> all, right, all right, here we go. All right, now, I mean, you still, you probably still can't see what I, what I wanted you to see, but this thing over here, let's see if my little pencil works. No. Oh, I tell you, what if I do a screenshot? Is that what I needed to do? <laughs> no, on that, on that picture, press edit. Oh. All right. Let's see how you press edit. You there we go. Okay. There we go. So that's gonna work, you think? Press the edit and press the pin. Press the pin. Is that the pin? That's a magic wand. Where's the pin? All right. Anyway, let's just do a little. Let's do a screenshot of that because I know I can. Do, I know I can do. Uh, Right with my pen on the screenshot. Well, this thing ain't letting me do it on this. All right. That's going to probably kick me off of here. See there? You got fancy. There you go. You got fancy. Look, my whole iPad done froze up. All right, here we go. Sorry. Y'all just bear with me. It's kicking me off. Techno issues. All right, here we go. Practice it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's see, I think I can draw with this. No? All right, well, anyway, let's see if we can just show you. You see, you can't see it too well, but this thing right here in front of the veil is the golden altar, okay? That's the lampstand, also known as the menorah, right there, that branch thing, it's hard to see. And then over there is the table of showbread. But I want you to see that golden altar is right there in front of the veil. Because in this scripture, that we were looking at, it says, look, it mentions the altar, it mentions the golden censer, it mentions incense. So I did put a couple of other pictures in here. This is the altar of sacrifice. Now, one thing that many people in this church are very familiar with is that the priest would have to take the coals off the altar of sacrifice in order to ignite the incense. So whenever we read in Exodus, I believe it was Exodus, right? Whenever Abihu and Nadab, which were Aaron's sons, which were also high priests, they were struck dead. Do you remember that? Because the Lord said they brought strange fire. So that means they brought fire from an alternate source, probably from a, the wrong kind of sacrifice, probably a sacrifice to a false god. But we don't know that with certainty because the Bible doesn't tell us. All it tells us is they have brought strange fire. You don't bring fire from another source other than the altar of sacrifice. What is the big deal, preacher? Because we keep talking to you about the message of the cross, about the message of the new covenant, about Jesus Christ and him crucified, about the fact that God sent the darling of heaven to make right all that which was made wrong and that this is another type because see the altar of sacrifice is a type of the cross Amen. because that's where the sacrifice was offered up unto the lord see that's the altar upon which the lord died it's not two pieces of wood no it's not there's no magic in the lord forgive me magic or whatever there's nothing it's not the two pieces of wood it's the fact that his blood was poured out and god chose the Roman Empire used the, used the cross. Don't let the Jehovah Witness knock on your door, by the way, and say, oh, there wasn't a cross. It was a torture state. I'm like, dude, please. And I told that Jehovah Witness elder, I said, sir, don't even go there with me. You and I both know that that there, that Rome used the cross. It's, ar it's archaeologically found, so let's not even go there. But they will show up at your house, and they will knock on your door, and they will try to give you minutia. Little bitty things to try to draw your head away from the truth so that they can come in like a little thief and steal your heart away from Jesus. They got another spirit. Anyway, let me not even get on that. The altar of sacrifice right here. So they take the coals off the altar of sacrifice. They put it on the golden altar that was before the veil and then they put incense on it. Now what I really want you to see is this censer. Anybody ever was born and raised Catholic in here? Yeah. 
So y'all been to some Catholic funerals oh, yeah. before. Now that, you got to admit, when you read this in the Word, it's kind of like a little bit, if you ain't ever been, Rob knows what I'm talking about. He was, probably, he was an altar boy back in the gap. That, but that's what they do. He put, they had a coal up in there, and they dumped some incense, and then that priest would start swinging that. And the next thing you know, it's like that wind would ignite it, and that, that smoke would start to be released. Okay, and they do it at Catholic funerals. I don't really know what I'm, but look, I'm not trying to say Catholicism is right because they have a censor. I'm just trying to draw your mind back to an illustration if you ever saw that. Okay, that's the point that I'm trying to make. And so there's a golden censor. Now, one of the things that I've learned about the golden censor that's interesting to me because it's mentioned in Revelation is that this golden censer was used in the Old Testament to shield the high priest. Okay, so there was an altar every day in front of the veil where he would take coals off this altar of sacrifice and he'd burn incense. That was part of his daily job. Okay, but once a year he would go through the veil beyond the curtain into that place called the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat between the cherubim, Exodus 25, 8, build me a tabernacle so that my presence can dwell with my people, and I will rest between the cherubim, all right? And so once a year, he would sprinkle blood on there, but guess what? He went in there with this golden censer, Amen. with incense burning on the inside. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because this golden censer shielded. So it's interesting to me, again, that the golden censer is that is, is in the Old Testament used to shield the high priest from wrath. But in Revelation, it's associated with pouring out the wrath of God. Now, here's the scripture that I was telling you about. Leviticus 16, 12 through 13. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat, which is where God said he would meet, that is upon the testimony, okay, that he die not. The high priest, when he entered into the Holy of Holies, once a year, you got to understand the presence of God is holy, and, there, and the blood of Jesus had not been shed yet. You, the, the letter to the Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, you know what he said? He, he said that you can boldly enter the throne room of grace through the veil which is his flesh. Hallelujah. Jesus died on the cross and he said it is finished. And when he did, what happened? The veil, according to Matthew 27, 51, was split from the top to the bottom, signifying that the entryway into the presence of the Lord had not been made. Listen to me, Christian. You can go to the Lord. Amen. You can go to the Lord. You don't need a priest. You don't need. You, well, you do need to. You do need the fivefold ministry, but you don't have to have your pastor to help you get in. Hallelujah! Jesus is your pastor. Jesus is your shepherd. He's the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. Jesus' blood, Hallelujah, was shed so that you could enter in to the throne room of grace. That's good news, Christian. Because look. You might be in a bind. We all going to be in a bind. We need to be able to get a hold of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I mean, I know I'm preaching better than, than <laughs> praise God. Because that's some good stuff. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, here we need be. But this just really focused. It stuck out to me. That he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Think about that. The prayers of all saints. <laughs> the, the, uh, the prayers of every saint... That ever lived. Now I, I, now, I don't know. Listen, I'm not making fun because Lord knows that my prayers, I done told y'all my prayers sounded like that before. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this. Lord, give me some prosperity. Lord, open up the door of blessing. I still sometimes pray that. But you know what? You know what? I remember one time I was praying. I was sharing this with somebody the other day. I was saying, Lord, I need you to do this. And you know what? I remember, I'm telling you, he might not talk to you this way, but he said, but what about what I need, man? And you know what the Lord was telling me? Because he doesn't really need me. 
The beautiful thing is that he allows me to right. work. Right. Oh, friend, that's some good stuff right there. He don't really need me because he can do it all himself. But he has created me and he has allowed me to partner with him in this endeavor that he is doing. And again, what is he doing? He's making right all that which was made wrong. Whenever the Lord said to me, I knew what he was talking about. When he said, son, what about what I need? I knew what he was talking about. He said, I died so that you could live. Now I need you to die so that I can live through you. See, God wants to use us as a vessel because he wants to make some stuff right. Amen. That's what he needs from you, Christian. That's what he needs from me, Christian. He needs us to get off of ourselves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can I say that? I surely I can. What are you talking about? This message that focuses on self and selfishness and is so egocentric and it's like, come on, preacher, make me feel good. Tell me what I want to hear. I'm not fussing at y'all, man. Y'all keep coming back. I'm like, y'all should be part of the choir, like cheering me on because y'all, some of y'all know I'm telling the truth. Amen. All right. Anyway, that's what I'm so. He goes on to say this, and they cried with a loud voice. I, I, I put this scripture up here because when I think of the prayers of all saints, I'm trying to make a point right now. And again, this is kind of my opinion because the scripture doesn't tell us exactly what that means. But I'm trying to paint a picture for you. And I'm going back to this scripture right here. This is the scripture about the martyrs. I'm just using this as an example. I'm not saying that this is what that's talking about. Okay, But in this example right here, it's saying, and they cried with a loud voice. How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Can I say that? Yeah, that's a seal five and it's specifically talking about that time frame. But do you not agree that the blood of the martyrs, the Bible says that the righteous blood of Abel cries out from the ground. Do you understand that Abel was the first martyr that his brother Cain killed him? And again, if we went all the way back, there it is again, the message of the cross. What you talking about? Cain brought vegetables. Abel brought a firstling of the flock, an animal sacrifice, innocent blood shed. The blood of righteous Abel cries out from the ground. What I'm trying to say is, is that the prayer of the saints have been crying out to God. And look, you know what our prayer should look like? I don't think we have to search too far. The Lord said it. Did the Lord not tell us how to pray? The Lord said this. After this manner, therefore, pray ye our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Not Buddha, not Krishna, not Allah, not any other false god, not Zeus, not Apollos, not any mythological or whatever fake god, lower god. No, your name is hallowed. Your name is altogether separate. Your name is altogether holy. Jesus said you need to pray this way. And look what else you need to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know, I've made this comment before and I'll make it again. There ain't no rebellion in heaven, my friend. As soon as Lucifer said, I will rise up above the throne of God. As soon as pride entered into his heart, I believe this. The incarnate Jesus said this to Peter. I saw Satan fall like lightning to the ground. He wasn't talking about when he was in his flesh. He was talking about when he was the eternal son of God. The pre-incarnate word. When he was at the side of the father. And he saw that rebellion in heaven. And God said, boom, you done. You're not, you, and, 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 you know, we're going to talk more about that as we go. But look, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know. When we studied the occult, I don't mean to get in all this, but we studied that. You remember how in the Message Bible it says something different? Don't read the Message Bible. Can I say that on TV? Yeah, I mean on video? Yeah, I can. Don't read the Message Bible. They, you know what they put in there? They put, as above, so below. That's an occultic term. That's right. And it's talking about the second heavens where principalities and powers. They want it to be on earth like it is in the second heaven where these, where these smaller gods, these Fallen angels, these demi demon spirits are moving and operating through human beings that have given themselves to them as above there in that realm. So below they want they're, they're working on their kingdom too, Christian. I hope you can know that. I hope you can believe that. All right. So look at Matthew. He goes on. He says this. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Well, that's powerful, right? The Lord wants you to forgive other people. Amen. 
If you want to be forgiven, you're supposed to forgive others. I don't think we, we could finish the whole message. I'm probably going to finish it anyway, but we, we, could pass, we could sit here for a long time. I'm talking to myself. You know, how, how easy it is for us to become hard-hearted towards other people. Can I tell you that you ain't messing nobody up but yourself, friend? That's right. You're just messing up yourself. Amen? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. It's his kingdom. Amen? It's his kingdom, Christian. So what was I trying to say? I was trying to say the prayers of all saints. Amen. That's ascending up to God. This is the wrath of God. This is my opinion, but the wrath of God. 30 minutes of silence. The trumpets are about to blow. And, and, he, and the prayer of all saints. And the prayers of all saints for all time are supposed to have been saying, How would be your name? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Jesus said it. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. An angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up and all green grass was burned up. You probably don't remember, but way back at the beginning of Revelation 7, God told the four angels on the corners of the earth, though the earth isn't flat, told the, the four angels at the four furthest points of the earth to not harm the grass or the trees until the servants of the Lord were sealed in their foreheads. It's interesting to me that the first thing God destroys in wrath is the first thing that he created that had seed within itself to replenish on the earth. You know, there's a big thing with the seed, you know. God created Things with seed in themselves that they could replenish upon the earth. Did you know that he created you with seed in yourself so that you could replenish upon the earth? I'm just trying to tell you that's another, that's another sign of what the Lord's plan was. Was that the earth would be populated with human beings because he desired to create an eternal family. Amen. We got to finish. Shut up. Just hang in there. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. This is one artist's depiction of hail mingled with blood and fire from heaven. This is just a scripture of Joel. I'm just going to move it. But it's describing the same thing. And these next two trumpets seem to be kind of connected. But the closer I looked at it, I kind of feel like I might have missed something earlier. But the next two, two trumpets seem similar to one another in that they both appear to be objects that fall from the sky. However, they produce two different effects on earth. But as I look at things so closely, I realize that this first trumpet doesn't say it came from the sky, but I still get the idea that it probably did. Okay, so here we go. Well, I'm going to found it, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire. See, it doesn't say it came from the sky, but most people believe that this could be a meteor, a meteorite, some kind of a heavenly body falling through, going through the atmosphere, but it doesn't tell us for sure that it's coming from the sky, but I'm just telling you what people have believed. But what it does say, it was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, you know, uh, I'm going to talk about a few things here in a moment, but... Um, Exodus 7, 17 through 18, you remember how Pharaoh, how God cursed Pharaoh and, and, and caused the plagues to hit Egypt. Look at this. Thus says the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. You see that picture right there? This is, I'm not trying to say that this is what this is. I'm probably going to have to stop because I got some other 
but let me just let me just finish this this particular concept and thought and then we'll stop and I'll hit off finish on the trumpets because I can see all the things uh, so I want to be respectful okay. I know y'all been working hard but you know what this is right here this bone in this water you know y'all want to take a guess what that is oil. yes it's oil it's the VP oil skin to me I th and I'm not trying to say that this is what that is so cut that out your mind I'm just trying to make a point right here okay when when this was going on, I remember looking at the TV, thinking, "Dude, look at that! Look at that oil! It looks like coagulated blood that was caught up in the marsh grass in Louisiana and stuff like that." Now, this right here is actually a river. This particular one is in Russia, and I, but I got I got to tell you that the reason I pulled this up was because when I was thinking of this, when I remembered Rand calling me one time when I was in Gulf Shores. Mm -hmm. Rand called me up and he said, dude, you need to Google this. The Yangtze River in China is turning into blood. And I Googled it and this kind of thing happens mm -hmm. where chemicals are released into waters and they turn red like this, where this oil was turned into water. I mean, was in the water and it looks like blood again i i have no reason to believe that god isn't going to literally turn the water into blood so i want you to know that's where i am god turned the water into blood he, he did it in egypt and i believe he's going to do it again it's going to cause the fish to stay but what i am trying to tell you is because my little weird mind thinks that way i want to remind you they got some evil people on earth and i want you to know that i believe that they're trying to mimic stuff having to do with the Lord. I believe that. I don't even believe that the BP thing was all an accident. You think they couldn't have stopped that thing? My uncle called, my uncle uh, didn't call me up but put on Facebook. He was a company man for Amica, which was bought out by British Petroleum. He invented two different things whenever, whenever my dad was still alive and my dad in, invested in it. And my uncle put on Facebook, well, I tried. I called him up and I told him exactly what they needed to create in order to stop it. He said they just ignored me. Okay. I'm not saying what he said would have worked, but what I'm saying is you think with all the technology they uh, anyway, so let me not go on and on. But possibilities of this, meteors or missiles. See, I can remember even Sister Tut trying to make the point. You always want to look at everything from all kinds of angles just so that you can be prepared. That this mountainous thing, this thing burning, it probably is a supernatural phenomenon in the sky. But John did not necessarily know what it was that he was seeing, right? Can we all agree on that? Yes. He just described it for what he saw. And I'm just trying to say that things like, you know, we got missiles nowadays that can really cause some damage. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit further and I'm, then I'm going to stop. But I want you to see this. Look at this. Revelation 8, 10 through 11. The third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters and the name of the star was called wormwood and the third part of the waters became <coughs> wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter you can't make yes ma'am like yes you can't make this stuff up so i'll put that in there okay wormwood what does it mean the noun okay a woody shrub so it's a plant that that is a poison all right, but look, what it means philosophically or spiritually, a state or source of bitterness or grief. What God's going to allow to happen is going to cause great bitterness and grief. But I wanted you to see this. She brought it up. You can't really tell what that says, but it's a New York Times paper. And this is the smaller caption at the bottom. And it says, Chernobyl fallout, apocalyptic tale and fear. But what it said in this, in this article that was written a long time ago it says a prominent russian writer recently produced a tattered old bible with a practiced hand he turned to revelations listen he said this is incredible the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters and the name of the star is called wormwood and the third part of the waters became wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter in a dictionary, he showed the Ukrainian word for wormwood, a bitter wild herb used as a tonic in rural Russia, Chernobyl. Isn't that, is that not just some weird facts though? So what are you trying to say, preacher? The word Chernobyl in Russian means wormwood. So again, I am, are you trying to say, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that they got some weird, uh, are you trying to say they did it on purpose? I'm trying to tell you, 
I don't doubt any of that. Right. What I'm trying to say is weird, weird stuff that these powerful, I'm not trying to say that this is the fulfillment of the book of Revelation. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's human beings on earth that are performing. Listen, this ain't like my little, I don't think he's watching, but if you are, you need to watch. My little friend, Timbo. And he was burning some little incense in the room. And he's like, let's do a spell. You want to do that, man? I'm not going to tell you what it was. I probably told you already. We're going to do a spell and we're going to make this happen. Okay. And little Tim Bob it was a little imp in the kingdom of darkness. But I'm telling you right now, light bulbs start popping and exploding. Okay. I'm talking about big time stuff, my friend. I'm talking about global witchcraft. Yeah. What do you think that the Washington Monument is? Can I just go ahead and say it? <laughs> Why do you think there's a pyramid with the eye of Horus on the dollar bill and that the person that was the, that was the secretary treasurer at the time was a degree mason that later became a vice president? Why do you think they got these obelisks all over Europe that were originated in Egypt and originally came from the land of Canaan that were called Asherapoles? And we'll stop right there because it gets a little bit graphic. Why do you think that there's that there's pyramids all and that the one that they found that the Mayan Indians built way back in the gap had 70,000 human remains. Why do you think that they got all this stuff going on? I'm trying to tell you that these people are performing. Not It's not just like little witches trying to get their little. No, there's a global stuff going on because we are in a war. And that might be hard for you to believe. But I'm here to tell you that fallen angels, angels rebelled against God. And just as you have given your free will to the Lord and the Holy Ghost wants to use you, they give their free will to the enemy. Okay? And, and, and the enemy wants to use them. All right, this is just a little bit more about Chernobyl. I didn't mean to, to get rid of that one. I wanted to see that's Fukushima. I think that's how you say it. Uh, now, I'm not trying to say that that was created, but that was a result of a tidal wave, right? They said the tidal wave hit. They couldn't keep it cool. And what happened? Radiation leaked into the ocean. So I'm just trying to give you a bunch of different angles because the idea of wormwood, it was weird because that whole thing happened with Chernobyl and Chernobyl was radiation and, you know, whatever the case. All right. So I just wanted you to be able to think. But this is what I'm closing with right here. To me, some of these things, again, you can't prove it, but whenever you think like I do, maybe I think too much and I'm a curse to myself. Well, not really, but maybe. This is, what is this right here? This is a picture of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. You know why? You know why? It's, you know why it's called corona? Because the word corona means crown. You ever seen Snoop Dogg on his little commercial? If you ever look at a follow, it's got a crown. That's what the word corona means. It means a crown. Now, again, I'm not trying to say say that this is what that is, but I'm trying to make the point to you, I would not be surprised if them wicked little people that are over there serving Satan didn't see this in the word of God and come up with this again. So Corona means the Antichrist. I saw and behold a white horse and a crown was given unto him. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say, is it possible? We already know the government doesn't say it. They done said that this thing was man made. Yep. Okay. They they I don't know how they're trying to say that it got in the market, if it got in the market, whatever, whatever. But I don't know about you. I feel like something's up. Mm -hmm. The whole world has changed. Isn't that weird? The way Hello, you're not in the Truman show, Christian. Mm -hmm. Something really, 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 really weird has happened. Since this virus was released on the earth. Wake up. Let's all wake up. Because listen. I even got people that don't believe like I do. Working in the hospital. And saying like what in the world is going on? It's a virus. Why are we freaking out so bad? Yeah. Nurses are saying that. They don't even believe the way I do. And that's what they're saying. I'm just like yeah go ahead and talk. Let's see what you got to say. <laughs> what? And then don't get me wrong now, I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle the virus. I'm not trying to belittle the fact that people get sick. We know some people that have gotten very sick. I'm not trying to question that part. I'm trying to question the response to and the way that everyone is acting globally. All right? So again, I'm not trying to say that this could be, but it wouldn't surprise me. The oil spill, the blood, right? Chernobyl, wormwood. Father, we don't know. We know you know. 
Rock Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you sent your only begotten Son to die on the cross for us. And that one came to live on the inside of us. Lord, I do believe that the days have changed. Lord, I don't believe that I ever thought that I would see times like this. I know that maybe some people would say that I'm out of control and that, you know, I'm, I'm over the top. But Lord, I truly believe in the atmosphere. I pray that you would, spiritually speaking, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears yes. to hear. I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment. I'm talking about your people called by your name, not just people in this church. But Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move and breathe fresh and anew upon your people. And that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. I pray that we would not be asleep. The Apostle Paul said, people that sleep, sleep in the dark. People that be drunk are drunk in the dark. The Apostle Paul said to be sober and to be awake, Lord, and Jesus, you said, work while it is day, for the nighttime comes when no one may work. Father, we believe it's still daytime. Yes. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit and that you would use us as individuals, Lord, and corporately to preach your gospel and to do your will upon yes. this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.